I started in the French Pyrenees and I ended up on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. You walk across the country. At that moment, I just knew that all things were possible. I knew all things were possible. I knew that I was capable of anything. It wasn't going to be easy and it wasn't going to be romantic and it wasn't going to be without some growing pains. But I developed a confidence in that moment that I could do anything and I could be anywhere. And so after I walked the Camino, I was like, I can do anything in the world. <laughs> and I like Spain. And I think I'm going to move to Spain. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Flourish in the Foreign, the podcast that aims to elevate and affirm the voices and the stories of Black women living and thriving abroad. I'm your host, Christine Job, a Black American woman living and thriving abroad in Barcelona. And I'm so happy that you are back for the next episode. Be sure to, of course, support the podcast. If you believe that Black women's stories should be told by Black women, <laughs> and if you believe that their voices and stories should be shared and should be heard, go ahead and become a Patreon subscriber of this podcast at www.patreon.com slash flourish foreign. Choose a tier that's comfortable for you and go ahead and commit to that, right? Walk that talk and commit to that. There's some great benefit for becoming a Patreon subscriber. A lot of amazing content that is on my Patreon page. And if you would prefer, you can go ahead and cash out the podcast and support this podcast that way. Of course, please give this podcast a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Go ahead and subscribe to this podcast and listen to this podcast every week. Yes, go ahead and do that. If this podcast has moved you, taught you something, blown your mind, made you cry, made you laugh, any of those things, please go ahead and share this podcast with whoever you think would benefit from this podcast. Share it with your favorite blog so that it could get included into a blog's uh, podcast list. Reach out to your favorite magazine so it's also included in their podcast list. Reach out to your other favorite podcast so that we can come together and collaborate. Go ahead and just let people know why you love and enjoy this podcast and why they should listen to it as well. This week's episode is, well, the guest of this week's episode is someone that the regular listeners kind of know already. And for the new listeners, this should be a treat for you because dun, 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 I, yes, I, the host of this podcast, I am the guest for this week. To be honest, it's been kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> I enjoy interviewing everyone else and getting to their business, but to sit down and actually do my own was a little bit uncomfortable, made me feel a bit vulnerable. And now I guess I understand how my guests feel and I hope I make them feel so comfortable and so at ease. But yes, I am this week's guest. And I guess I will stop teasing it and I will, I will tell you more about it. Here we go. I'm Christine and I am the host of Flourish in the Foreign, the podcast that's all about elevating and affirming the voices of Black women living and thriving abroad. And this is my story. I am 33 years old. I moved abroad when I was 30 years old, and I currently live in Barcelona, Spain. I'm from Atlanta, unless you're from Atlanta. If you're from Atlanta, I'm from Suwannee, Georgia. <laughs> I think that my childhood was probably indicative of why I ended up wanting to move abroad or living abroad. 
I started to fly by myself when I was quite young. I would travel domestically in between my parents, my parents divorced. And so I would visit my dad who lived in Florida and go in between Florida and Georgia a lot. And I would fly by myself. I think that is important because I never learned the fear of flying. I never learned the fear of being by myself. I never learned the fear of going to different places and not knowing people and being uncomfortable. My dad moved to Germany when I was 10 for the Air Force. And I started to internationally soul travel then. Traveling internationally is awesome. You get to go into the lounge, you eat all the candy that you want. You get on the plane first. They put you in your own row or section. No one's allowed to come and talk to you or sit next to you. They give you all the snacks. I think that this is probably the foundation of why I was very comfortable with international travel. I associated it with fun and treats. <laughs> you get off the plane first and everyone's so nice to you. And so for me, solo international travel helped to form how I felt about traveling. Being in Europe and having my dad do road trips and my dad took me to Paris when I was 13 and these things just start to feel regular. And when it feels quite ordinary, then it doesn't feel overwhelming at all. I knew from probably my 17th birthday, that I wanted to live abroad. I'm not sure exactly why, but I knew that I wanted to live abroad. I knew that I wanted to see more than Swanee, Georgia, or Atlanta, Georgia, or Florida, or anywhere else I had been in the world. I just knew I wanted to see and do. When I went to university, I knew immediately that I wanted to study abroad. There was no question. I didn't need to be convinced. I couldn't be dissuaded if someone was trying to dissuade me. I was extremely proactive. I went to a predominantly white institution and no one was marketing towards black students. I was just there. I was in all the study abroad informational meetings. I went to all the study abroad fairs where they had all the tables and the, the representatives of all the programs. I would spend hours in the study abroad fair. I took every single pamphlet. I didn't really intend to, but I did because every place was like, oh, I hadn't considered Tanzania. Yeah, I'll take that. Oh, I hadn't considered Ireland. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that one. I would come home to my dorm and just have this huge sack of glossy brochures and I would just sit there and look at all of the places I could go and I, what I could learn. And I didn't care that some of these places I was totally enamored with had nothing to do with my major <laughs> at all. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. These classes didn't make any sense for my degree. I was just fascinated that I could go. After going through all of those programs and leaflets, I actually decided to go with a program that was based in my institution. I attended the University of Georgia, and they have a program called UGA in España, and I decided to go to Valencia with the program. It fit my major and my minor. I was a Spanish minor, and I was a business management major. It was a crazy experience. It was not what I had romanticized it to be at all. I was the only black person in my cohort. I probably was the only black person at my university in Valencia, the Universitat de Valencia. It was strange coming from a chocolate city like Atlanta to be in a place where everyone's just like, huh, what are you doing here? <laughs> It was a little bit tough and also it was an experience that I took very, very seriously and I was excited and I wanted to go to class and I had several other students that were in my cohort that were just trying to get wasted every day and would show up to school with red 
mouths, purple and red mouths and lips from drinking red wine. As an adult now, I'm just like, how is that possible that you're, you're drinking so much red wine that it stains your mouth and your tongue and that you can't brush your teeth either the night before or this morning? I was contending with a situation in which obviously culturally it was very different. I'm in a different place. I'm learning primarily in Spanish. And I'm in a situation in which I'm with people who are not taking the opportunity as seriously as I am taking it. That was disheartening. Even though it wasn't the romanticized version of what I thought studying abroad was going to be, I wasn't put off by living abroad or living in Spain at all. I just took it as this is life. And I learned a lot about myself. I became very independent coming from Georgia, where we drive everywhere, just everywhere. And having to walk 30 to 45 minutes to school was a complete difference. I think I learned a lot about myself and I grew up a lot. So I came home from study abroad and I graduated in 2009, which was not a a great year for graduating from university. And I knew that I wanted to move abroad. I just didn't know how. I would Google a lot and I would just try to do as much research as I could and apply to a lot of places. And I would apply to government jobs that maybe could get me abroad. I would ask family friends if they knew somebody that was working abroad. And they'd be like, yeah. And I would try to wrangle those people down to talk to me so I can move abroad. And it just was very, it was a tough time. I just graduated from university. I had done everything I was supposed to do. And I was not getting a job in my field. I wasn't going abroad. I was working at The Gap, selling jeans. And it was definitely a knock to my ego. It humbled me a lot, but it also taught me so much. That's where I started meditating, actually, was in the fitting room of a gap, folding, it seems like, hundreds of pairs of jeans that were left in the fitting rooms and learning how to quiet my mind and focus and visualize on what I wanted. It also taught me how to be a salesperson and how to talk to anyone and how to understand people's needs. So it became quite handy in my future endeavors as a business person to learn how to sell a pair of $90 jeans when everyone just hit a recession. So I worked at The Gap for a year. I applied and I got accepted into law school at the University of Miami. And I decided to go to law school because what else was there to do? (laughs) I went to law school and I quickly understood that I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't come from a family of lawyers. And so I was determined to find someone to mentor me or someone I could shadow, which I did. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. That's what this is? No, I don't want to do that. So... I quickly was trying to figure out, well, what else can I do with this law degree? And being the nerd that I am, was one day reading the school bulletin that they always send that nobody reads. (laughs) The email, this is what's happening on campus, and no one reads that. I read it, and I read an article about this phenomenal entrepreneurial woman who was the director of The Incubator on campus and a professor in entrepreneurship. And I decided I needed to track her down. And so I I left the law campus to come onto the main campus and basically just try to hang out in this incubator in the office of this entrepreneurial program. And I got on enough people's nerves that they were just, what are you doing here? What do you want? And I'm like, I'm trying to meet this woman. And they're like, she's very busy. Who are you? What are you about? I told them, they're like, do you want to be a legal fellow here? And I said, yes. And I started to be a legal fellow at my school's entrepreneurship incubator. It's a moment that has reverberated in my life because I fell in love with consulting and helping people develop businesses from ideation to launch. And particularly because it was just amazing to 
be trusted enough for people to divulge kind of their heart's desires. And so I I did that. And when I graduated from law school, I joined this director who I did eventually meet. I joined her private company that was a startup incubator and accelerator in downtown Miami. I was in a Publix grocery store in the frozen food aisle when I got a call and she says, hey, Christine, do you have a passport? And I'm like, of course I have a passport. Yes. She's like, great. Come drop it off at the office tomorrow. And I was like, okay, but why? And she was like, oh, we're going on trade mission to Namibia and South Africa. That was incredible. I was going on trade mission to Africa within two or three weeks of graduating from law school. While everyone else was studying for the bar exam, I was on trade mission, and that was phenomenal. I got to meet with the U.S. ambassador to Namibia at the time, who was a black woman, and it was just quite life-changing. I was like, I want to definitely live and work abroad, but I had a death in my family that spurred me to return to Atlanta, and I didn't know how else I was going to to make it happen. I started my own consultancy doing business development and business strategy for primarily small and micro businesses in the holistic wellness space, but also for some creatives as well. I liked it, but I quickly got burnt out by just the hustle and the grind. I wanted to do something else. I didn't know what. And while I was doing that, I was looking for other opportunities to go abroad. I found one. I interviewed and I accepted a position to move to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And so I gave up my beautiful apartment in Inman Park, Atlanta, and I moved to Marietta in the suburbs. And two months after that, the offer was pulled and I didn't move to Malaysia. I was heartbroken. I was confused. I was quite devastated. And I didn't know what to do with myself at that time. I did not know what to do. I didn't know what life was. I was just like, this sucks. And I found myself hiking on Kennesaw Mountain and just kind of partaking in some active meditation, trying to not allow anger to just, I don't know, boil all of my insides. And that's where I got, I don't know, divine insight about going on the Camino de Santiago. Now, I had only heard about the Camino de Santiago perhaps six months before from a friend who told me she wanted to do the Camino de Santiago. And when she explained it to me, I was like, wait, you're walking across Spain with all of the things that you need to sustain yourself on your back. You sleep in communal hostels called albergues and it takes about a month to do. You wanna do that? I was like, okay, girl, that sounds great for you. So when that thought came to me, I immediately was like, that's strange, next. But it wouldn't stop coming. It was quite dogged. And I was like, what is this? Why does this keep on coming to me? I hate this. I don't want to do this. I wasn't very outdoorsy at the time. I enjoyed brunch on a terrace and a nice cute picnic with a car in sight. The thought of hiking (laughs) for 30 days sounded like nonsense. But it wouldn't leave me alone. I decided to investigate. And when I really understood, you're going to be walking 800 kilometers, 500 miles. I was like, hell no, I'm not doing this. (laughs) But of course, the universe is hilarious. I came up with all these excuses. Oh, I can't possibly do it. I'm a single woman. It's not safe. And then, of course, I immediately scroll down to the next post on this forum. And it's this elderly woman of like, 80 or 75, who's like, this will be my 15th Camino. And I'm just like, man, I cannot allow this older woman to just play me like this. I just can't. I can't do it. I took these very 
minor steps to just investigate further to see like, could I do it? And immediately doors were just blown open. People were put directly into my life. And so I was going. And so within less than a month of the contract being reneged, my life being changed, I left to the Camino. I flew into France. I don't speak French at all. And I flew into Bordeaux. There wasn't a lot of people in the airport that spoke English. (laughs) And I was just pleading with them. I was just like, please, train station. And of course, as soon as I say that, I look up and there's a clear sign that says train station. I go to start the Camino in San Jean Pierre de Port. And the first day of the Camino, you go up the French Pyrenees mountains and down the Spanish Pyrenees mountains. It was a beautiful day until it wasn't. It was hard and I was crying and I was like, life is dumb. (laughs) I have dumb insights. This is ridiculous. But everything worked out. Small graces and small hilarious moments just to keep you just that much amused (laughs) so that you don't have a breakdown kept on occurring. I took it day at a time, step at a time. We call it paso a paso. And I had such a life-affirming moment walking the Camino. And I had to deal with a lot of nonsense that when you're walking for six to eight hours a day and you're quiet with yourself, a lot of stuff that you haven't wanted to deal with come up. And so the day came where I ended up walking onto the beach in Finisterra. And that was, I started in the French Pyrenees and I ended up on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. You walk across the country. At that moment, I just knew that all things were possible. I knew all things were possible. I knew that I was capable of anything. It wasn't going to be easy and it wasn't going to be romantic and it wasn't going to be without some growing pains. But I developed a confidence in that moment that I could do anything and I could be anywhere. And so after I walked the Camino, I was like, I can do anything in the world. And I like Spain, and I think I'm going to move to Spain. When I came back, I was just very determined on figuring out how to move to Spain. Because I walked the Camino in 2014, and I immediately was like, how do I make this happen? I started researching. I was on all the Facebook groups. I was searching. I was asking questions. And I made friends with a lot of people, and I got on a lot of Skype calls, but things just weren't happening. I wanted to move abroad in a very particular way, I thought. I wanted a Spanish firm to hire me. Even though I did research, I obviously hadn't done a lot of research to understand that the you know unemployment rates in Spain and that getting hired from a Spanish firm, especially being non-EU, was just not going to probably happen. I, I looked at all my options. I knew that there were opportunities to teach abroad, but I didn't want to teach abroad because I wasn't a teacher. So I just kept on trying to figure it out and working it out. I had produced a music and spiritual festival called Seeker Fest in Atlanta, and... I had been building up and trying to build up my business. And I just got burnt out (laughs) and quite anxious and quite depressed in 2015 and 2016. I knew I needed to just change. I thought maybe I should just be a proper lawyer or something and just do that. But I still wanted to live abroad. And so I applied for the... North American Language Assistant Program in Spain. I had a consultation with a Dutch attorney who was basically giving me the rundown of the Dutch-American Friendship Treaty, which is an entrepreneurship visa, a way to move to the Netherlands. I was kind of keeping all of my options open. 
when 2017 happened, I was just knowing for myself that I was going to move. I was very determined. I was doing my meditation. I was scripting in my journal. I was visualizing every single day. I knew I was going to move. And I had my heart set on Spain and I actually had my heart set on Barcelona. I was doing all of the visualizations. I would watch YouTube videos of a walk in Barcelona. These are videos where people have just taken, I guess, their GoPro and walked down streets and they just put music behind it. That's all the video is, that you're just walking down a street in Barcelona. And I would sit there and I would be part of my visualization and I would just be like, yep, that's me. I, I knew all the streets. I knew where I wanted to live, all these things. So in April of 2017, I kind of got another divine nudge, I would say. I was always a part of travel groups. I always got a lot of notifications for travel fairs, but I would be like, no, I can't go. I can't do, I don't know. But I had a friend of mine who did not travel send me a flight deal. And I was like, this means something. Because you don't ever go nowhere. This means something. And I decided to take the travel deal. It was quite cheap. It was basically from Atlanta to Barcelona for maybe 300 US round trip or something like that. And we had a stop in Casablanca, Morocco. And I saw the dates in which it was good for. It was good for if you want to go between the end of April and you could do a week. Or you could do the end of April until mid-June. And so I decided to do that. I know that being American, I have that passport privilege where I can be in the EU for 90 days on a tourist visa, which is not a visa you have to apply for. I was just like, I'm just going to step out on faith and book this long trip to Europe. And so I booked it and I immediately freaked out. <laughs> and that was at the very beginning of April. And at the end of April, I left and I flew to New York and then I flew to Casablanca and then I flew to Barcelona. And it was a hilarious experience because even all those videos that I've watched I got so lost. <laughs> All of those videos that I watched, I did not know, obviously, where I was going or anything like that. Had no clue. Got to the hostel eventually. It had taken me like an hour and 15 minutes to get to the hostel. And that hostel was definitely like 15 minutes from the metro stop. I don't even know what that was about. I honestly don't. And I had a layover in Barcelona because I was actually going to Milan to do an interview and I ended up meeting uh, someone and that kind of changed the trajectory of my experience in Spain. I go to Milan and I come back to Barcelona and I end up staying in Barcelona with this guy that I had <laughs> just met. I go back home in June to do my visa for this language assistant program. I come back to Barcelona. I flew in on a Tuesday, and that Thursday there was the terrorist attack in, in Barcelona. That was quite intense. I had gotten actually placed in the language assistant program in La Rioja. I wasn't even going to be living in Barcelona. Before I moved to La Rioja at the end of September, there had become a lot of political unrest in Catalonia, the comunidad or the state in which Barcelona is the capital. There's a lot of calls for independence, independence referendum. I left on a Saturday and the very next day, there are these super violent clashes with the Spanish police, between protesters and people who are having this referendum. This referendum was deemed illegal. It was a very interesting welcome into the country. First having a terrorist attack, then there being a lot of political tension, and then there just being an outright political clash. And it was strange because being in Barcelona and Catalonia, there was definitely a different sense of the story. And then moving to northern Spain, 
in La Rioja and having the Riojanos having a different perspective, obviously, of what was happening in Catalonia. But living in northern Spain for a year to teach was very eye-opening. I realized as I entered the primary school that I had not been around small children at all in my life. I mean, the last time was probably when I was babysitting when I was 14, 15. This was definitely strange and, and different, but it was a cool experience because kids will keep you on your toes and they will say the darndest things. I was assigned two schools, one in the capital of La Rioja, La Gronio, and one in Alberite. And the one in La Gronio, when I would tell people, yeah, I teach at Madre de Dios, and they'd be like, oh, that's the immigrant school. <laughs> and I'd be like, what does that mean? They're like, oh, it's troubled because it's the immigrant school. And I didn't know what that meant <laughs> until I went to the school and it was just the brown school. It was a lot of first generation, second generation kids where their parents are from Mali or from Nigeria and Pakistan, Bangladesh, Morocco, some children that were from Eastern Europe. This was that school. It was diverse. It was very brown. And I loved it. And they were shocked to have me as a teacher. They were like, wait, there are Black people in the United States. <laughs> there are Black people who are not athletes in the United States. Oh, and wait, you went to law school and you speak perfect English? It was mind-blowing for them. I loved that because they had never had a teacher that looked remotely like them and they probably wouldn't have a teacher that looked remotely like them at all. To be that for them was very moving. It was such a life-changing moment. One of those moments where you're like, well, I'm just going to do something for myself. I'm going to have this experience. And you just realize how interconnected we are and how at every moment you can be of service and you can be present for other people. I knew, though, that I, I wasn't going to be a teacher for a long time. Even though La Rioja was such a great little place, that it was, it's a family place, it, great wine, great gastronomy, very low cost of living. But I wanted to live in the city. And at the time, my partner lived in Barcelona. So I moved to Barcelona to be with him. I started to work remotely for a boutique web development company that was based in D.C. First as a writer for their blog on business topics. And then being brought on as a marketing manager and strategist for the company. It allowed me to make U.S. dollars and live in Spain, which is nice. I highly recommend it. And it allowed me to even do traveling while I was based in Barcelona. I went to Puerto Rico. <laughs> I went to Italy and Morocco. And I actually spent a month in Asia. But then I decided I wanted to go back into my own business and develop my own consultancy again. It's very easy to get into an expat bubble living in Barcelona, which is a very privileged bubble that it's a part of passport privilege and it's a part of not being dependent on like the local economy for income. The local politics definitely affect my life. I live in Catalonia, which is a state of Spain, and there is a section of the population that wants to become its own country, <laughs> separate from Spain. And because Barcelona is the capital, a lot of protests and gatherings happen here. There has been conflict. There has been riots. There has been police brutality. It definitely affects your life. <laughs> I mean, unless you are planning on living in an expat compound, somewhere, I'm sure that the local politics will affect you in some kind of way. 
I think being an American is quite an advantage in Spain because Spain has a very laid back society. Culturally, they do not live to work. They work to live and just about that, they are very relaxed and in my opinion, not ambitious in the way we describe ambitious in the United States. That can be aggravating when you first move because you're just like, does nobody want my money? Can y'all do this a little bit faster? Can these things get done? But also, there's a sense of respect for people creating boundaries. Like, no, I'm not going to work and I need rest. And not being beholden to every single euro that might come their way. I think that at least American ambition or American proactiveness gets you very far in Spain. If you're willing to create maybe a business, if you really are quite proactive, I think that that kind of American gumption goes quite far because not a lot of people are like that. Even the other Europeans or wherever they are in the world don't have that. That's probably an advantage, but also you stick out like a store thumb. People are like, You're American. I was like, yeah. (laughs) They're like, but I like you. You're American and I like you, though. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Yeah, because you're not too American, you know? Mm, I don't know what that means, but (laughs) okay. Okay. Being a black woman in Spain is a very interesting experience. And some people will flip the switch on you. They will treat you one way. They'll be like, oh, you're black. And then they'll be like, oh, you're American. Oh, okay. And I don't appreciate that because I'm black. First and foremost, keep that same energy. However you felt is however you feel and keep that same energy. Several of my friends and myself included have been propositioned by older white Spanish men as if we were prostitutes. And that was not okay. I think sex work, legal and consenting sex work is whatever you want it to be. But to just proposition someone because they are a black woman to think that they're going to give you sex or you can buy sex from them. It was so shocking. It was so offensive. And you don't understand what's happening. And then you understand what's happening. And then you can't believe what's happening. And... It's just bizarre. And it starts making you question yourself, and that's not okay. What am I doing that makes you think that's okay? And of course, it's not you. It's them. And it's shameful. It was very shameful because Spain, and Italy in particular, is quite known for sex trafficking of young women from particularly Nigeria who are trafficked. And they have done specials in in Spain, and this is well known. I mean, I knew it, and I'm not from Spain. It's very disturbing. It's like, so you know these women who are doing this work are probably not completely consenting to this work or were trafficked here. And you're okay with it, and you're propositioning me. You're assuming that I have probably been trafficked here and then you are okay with continuing the cycle so there there's that I think it's a little bit strange being in Spain being a black woman and you see black culture everywhere because it's a hip global culture and yet people don't understand where it originates they see it on white faces. They see it in Rosalia or Bad Bunny and and they just think that they are being cool and it's bizarre to me. For example, when I was teaching La Rioja, I was asking the sixth graders, what is your favorite music? And these kids had the audacity to say, yeah, I like trap music. Do you know what trap music is? I'm from Atlanta, so... And I was like, trap music? The heck? They're like, yeah, you know, like Bad Bunny. And I was like, okay, you're 11, 12. You don't need to be listening to trap music. You don't need to be knowing what a trap is. And Bad Bunny is definitely not trap music. That, I think, has been something that 
has definitely gotten on my nerves is just lack of acknowledgement, the lack of curiosity of like, well, where did Bad Bunny get this from? Spain is not perfect at all, but what I do like about living in Spain is the sense of community. Community is all that we have. We're, we are all in this together. I enjoy the fact that they have health care, and I enjoy the fact that for me, on the visa that I have, I have to buy private health care insurance. It is extremely affordable. My first year, I paid 70 euros um, a month for private health care, no co-pays, no anything, no deductible. That was health care. Now I'm paying about 35 euros a month for excellent private health care. It was really important for me to have a lifestyle in which joy and, and pleasure were a focal point. People enjoy life and they enjoy beautiful things. They want beautiful experiences. And that might sound strange. It, it sounded strange for me being around people who were like, I'd rather walk on this side of the street because it's more beautiful. No, let's go this way because it's more beautiful. And you're like, but let's just get there. It just changed how you see life. But I think Spain has definite issues. The Spanish, in my opinion, are not well educated in their history and their effects on the world. They seem quite oblivious as to why most of the world speaks Spanish. They seem quite oblivious to that effect of colonization. I feel that people like to be like, oh, imperial Spain, but they don't see it as Spain the colonizer. I think Spanish people can be quite ignorant in that sense. Living abroad was always a part of my life vision. I always knew I wanted to go abroad, and living abroad is all about choices and cultivating the life that I want. Living abroad isn't traveling abroad. You still have to adult. Like you still have issues, family issues, personal issues. You still are in the world. Nothing be gets dissolved because you are living abroad. But for me, there were just some trade-offs that I appreciated. I'm not sure if there's a utopia for Black women living abroad, because if someone is not trying to put you down because you're Black, they're trying to be like, but you're a woman. <laughs> Moving to Europe, I think I was very aware that it was going to be a homogeneous place, that there wasn't necessarily going to be a lot of Black people. But I chose Spain because I spoke Spanish and I've had a lot of experience in Spain. It was probably like a comfort thing. I was like, I kind of know this place. And of course, you just don't. Studying abroad is one thing. That was six months. Walking the Camino, that's a month. But living in a place is quite different. I started Flourish in the Foreign because as I was living abroad, I kept on getting the questions of like, what are you doing? Why are you in Barcelona? What are you doing? Questions that I noticed that non-people of color, white people were just not getting. It almost seemed like an accusation as if how dare you be more than I expect you to be, especially as a black American woman. How dare you go, see, do, be, say things that are not within my construct of who you are. I got really frustrated by that because it's a sentiment that I had experienced while living in the United States. I also encountered and kept on encountering amazing black women who are also just out here living abroad from across the diaspora. And it was nothing. It was just them deciding to live their life outside of their home country and just being spectacular as black women are. I wanted to showcase these stories because I had known that I'd wanted to live abroad since I was 17 and I studied abroad and I traveled and I really, really tried to move and live abroad for about eight years. 
And I realize now, had I had these stories of these black women who are so different in so many ways, who wanted different things out of their life, who had different careers, who set out about it completely different, and they were living all around the world, had I had these stories to inspire me, to motivate, but also to give me a sense of direction about how I could go about this deep desire to live abroad. I really believe that I would have done it sooner. And what meeting amazing Black women living all over the world and interviewing them for this podcast has really confirmed to me is that you can go however you want to go. You can do whatever you want to do. It requires some planning and some true confidence and belief in yourself, commitment to making it work and resilience, but you can do it. And that's what I showcase on this podcast. I also truly believe that what this podcast is demonstrating is a theory that I have had for a while now. And that is the act of moving and living abroad for Black women, and I'll say even more particularly for Black American women, is an act of wellness. Truly, for Black American women, our identities, what we can do, who we should be, what we should aspire to has largely been dictated to us. Even women who are self-aware and self-directed, there is still a heavy blanket of oppression and societal expectation that I believe suffocates and clouds our ability to thrive. The act of going abroad is an intentional act to leave all the things that are familiar and to open yourself up to all of the incredible possibilities for life. It may sound ridiculous, but the act of having to be awesomely awake to every aspect of your life, every decision, minor, major, in everyday life, it really does change how you act and how you see yourself. All of a sudden, choices that were always just a given and automated at home are now firmly placed in your lap to decide what is best for you. And I think that choice, that radical decision, is complete wellness. It is the gateway of wellness. To begin to plant the seeds that truly cultivate a life well-lived on your own terms. And as Black American women, and as Black women across the diaspora, we are not monolithic. Our experiences are not monolithic, our hopes and desires are not monolithic, and our lifestyle and aspirations and purpose in this world is just not monolithic. And so the experience of going abroad and having choice just be completely open to you, to decide if it really is in resonance with you and in alignment with you, be it what you have for breakfast, what time you have breakfast, how you interact in community, the availability of health care and how you see yourself and how you take care of yourself, to cultural fit and societal norms that resonate with who you are deeply. I believe that this is a true act of wellness to be able to make these decisions about what is truly the best for you, for us, as Black women. And this wellness is so much more than, I think, what is mainstream right now. It really refers to a financial, professional, mental, emotional, interpersonal, physical, all-encompassing wellness, because the choice really then becomes ours. And I'm not a person who believes that everyone should go abroad and stay abroad and your home country is absolute trash. That is not the whole point of this podcast or even really the basis of my philosophy. It's because that the opportunity to have choice does something to you. It changes how you see the world and how you see yourself. And in that change, you can go back home and contribute that to your community in a really powerful way. And so 
that is what Flourish in the Foreign truly is about, is an exploration of wellness, complete and whole wellness for and by Black women who are living abroad, and also the elevation and affirmation of their stories and how they see themselves living and thriving abroad. I hope that you all enjoyed learning a little bit more about me and my journey abroad. And if you want to stay connected with me, you can definitely follow this podcast, Flourish Foreign, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It is all under Flourish Foreign. Definitely check out the podcast website at www.flourishintheforeign.com. Also, if you are interested in working with me, as I told you in my story, I'm a business strategist. I've been a business strategist, I've told you guys, since I was in law school. And I've recently added another service to my business strategy business in which I am really helping women of color, black women, leverage their expertise and talents into viable and sustainable, yes, viable and sustainable online businesses that are not only professionally fulfilling, so important, so important to be doing what you want to do, professionally fulfilling and financially abundant, financially abundant in whatever that means to you. And I'm helping women do that. And it's been so, so rewarding because I really firmly believe in women of color, especially black women, being able to utilize their experience and work for themselves in in a work environment that just systemically undervalues black women. It really is just empowering and it gives me so much joy to help black women and women of color to really find their voice and find their confidence, to really cultivate a life of financial wellness, professional wellness, physical, mental, and emotional wellness. That is what I'm all about. I take a holistic approach to my strategy. Definitely go ahead and check my personal website out, which is www.christinejobe.com. If you're thinking about converting your career and your expertise into an online business so that you can go abroad on your terms. You can be financially and professionally fulfilled. I think that is all for this week. Thank you to Zachary Higgs who produced the music for this podcast. If you're looking for some original music for your podcast, your YouTube channel, your Instagram, whatever you have, He works with all different types of content creators and he can create something special and cool for you. I will include all of his information in the show notes. And until next time, please, please, please take care of yourself, right? Wellness, wellness and self-care are not fluffy words. They are practices, sometimes a little bit difficult for us to be committed to, but always, always so, so important. So please take care of yourself and see you next week. Bye. On the next episode of Flourish in the Foreign. If you're in a predominantly black nation, colorism is definitely a thing. So there is prejudice based on where you are on the skin tone chart, sure. But in terms of just being black, that's not a conversation. The bigger issue is who are your people? They wanna know what region of the country or what region of the continent or what region of the world you're coming from. Because that's really how people categorize themselves. And I always say that we all have different ideas about our own blackness depending on where we were raised and the environment we were raised. It's just a reaction to the rea- society you live in. I, I think it's one of the greatest privileges I've had. There is something to be said about having your blackness affirmed. Mm-hmm.